I'm back! Today we're going to talk about Overlord and how not to summon a demon lord, and how actions speak louder than words, but also how actions and words speak louder than vague intentions. First, the, the run-on sentence for the setup. Overlord is a show about a guy who gets stuck in his ironic Isaka. Greater Lynch Isaka. avatar Isaka. when him and his Isaka. guild Isaka. special Isaka. special Isaka. playhouse Isaka. get sucked Isaka. into a fantasy Isaka. world Isaka. after the MMO Isaka. servers Isaka. shut down. Isaka. All of the guild's player-made NPCs, Isaka. items, Isaka. Isaka. and Isaka. the Greater Lynch Isaka. get sucked Isaka. into this fantasy Isaka. world Isaka. and are Isaka. overpowered. So in some way, this kind of sets itself apart from other Isaka. isekai shows where big part of the setup is the camaraderie between the ghoul player and his former MMO mates and how he wants to make what they made together, their guild house, how he wants to honor it and bring it into the future and feels really proud of what they built in that game. It's the first time that one of these- that's not true. Log Horizon still exists. It's a notable time because a lot of isekai shows completely ignore the massive multiplayer part of the MMO online sucked into another world game. It seems that unlike WoW, where there's two section parts where you can go be for the horde or for the losers, in Overlord, the guild's theme was to be non-humans and they themed their playhouse as seven impossible Mario map maker levels. And they filled their super special awesome house with player-made NPCs, which in the game were rudimentary attack enemies when they come here, follow simple orders and commands, but you could write flavor bios for all of your NPCs to your heart's content. But when they crossed over to the new world, those bios then informed the characters of every single one of the NPCs. Which is cool, because they took that role-playing aspect where people pretend that things are this way, and then they made it really that way. And those NPCs now have an effect on Ghoul once he's in this world, and they have their own sense of expectation based off of their vague notions of what it was like to be a mindless NPC, but as themselves all along. And this is the start of one aspect of the comedy of Overlord, as the Overlord's internal monologue does things like, oh, this is monstrous, or wow, I'm really just an office worker, or what am I supposed to do and stand here? Why do I need to give them orders? His actions of attack this, fortify the castle, Watch out for intruders. Give me information about the humans in the surrounding area. Al Ghul has made it and now needs to fake it so he can do it. There is a solid layer of performance to Al Ghul that's very open in the show where he thinks one thing and aims to behave another way. And this dichotomy is barely wrestled over inside of the mind of Ghul. Like, his humanity is gone. He gives lip service to it at best. Once in a while, he'll spare someone, or he'll do a little village, but let's, let's talk. Every aspect of restraint that Ghoul shows is then twisted by the NPC's expectations of him. So Ghoul rescues a town from some bandits, but not bandits like full-on actual knights. They're going to be a political uh, pawn, a political falling victim to some kind of internal politics of the kingdom and Ghoul saves them. However, it, Ghoul has to stop his minions from just consuming the town. He has to justify it by saying that now they're gonna be their pawn and their place for experiments. And this moves from a light justification. A couple of seasons later, Ghoul is treating it like an experiment ground, a place where anything can happen, but he just has one or two, three things that he wants to think are free to live there openly. Ghoul takes over a lizard people, an entire race of several tribes of lizard men, and resurrects a few of the key warriors in order to subjugate them completely. Ghoul gets bored and starts LARPing as an adventure in the town. He says that it's just for recon and learning about their surroundings. But when his minions take this information and stage an attack, not stage, actually attack the town and kidnap an entire section of people. Ghoul pretends to fight them and see what they're doing and is completely surprised by their actions and is all right with just thousands of people being used as fuel in the 
in the tomb of Nazareth. Ghoul feels nothing for these people, even though he knows them and sees the way they live and is part of their daily life, he feels nothing when they're then part of a machine. He doesn't care when they're brutally murdered or ripped apart or burnt or eaten or devoured. He comments several times that since coming to the world, he doesn't feel like a person and lacks guilt for any action. He is cool just watching them being used and casually murdered in the depths of his Mario map maker. To be clear, I'm not saying that this is a bad thing. Anti-heroes or having a full-on villain be a protagonist is a well-worn part of fiction, and seeing an undead kingdom take hold and rise up and perhaps take over a planet can be pretty entertaining, even if there are a lot of really boring filler episodes. And I'm also not saying that you are bad or evil for enjoying it or that somehow you should be. I'm just saying that there's this thing that we should think about, bringing your attention to this aspect of the show and relating it to a bigger part of your life, hopefully. There is some glee in the show when a bad person gets their comeuppance. Enjoying a show is not a moral failing, but we should be aware of what is happening in front of us. To be human or not to be. Ghoul is our gesture. He takes up his skull and dances for our amusement. He and we are both shocked by how easily it gets out of hand. Who Whose skull is that? A pestilence on him from a mad rogue. A poured flagon of Rhenish in my head once this same skull. Sir was Yorick's skull, the king's jester. This? Even that. Let me see. Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him well. Horatio, a fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. He hath borne me on his back a thousand times. And now, how abhorrent in my imagination is this? My gorge rims at it. Here hung those lips that I have kissed. I know not how oft. Where be your gibbs now? Your gambles? Your songs? Your flash of merriment, that were wont to set a table roar. Not one now to mock your own grinning? A chap fallen? Pray thee, Horatio, tell me one thing. What's that, my lord? Dost thou think Alexander looked of this fashion in the earth? Even so, my lord. And smelt so? Even so, my lord. To what base uses we may return, Horatio? Why may not imagination trace this noble dust of Alexander till he find it stomping a dunghole? Too coarsely to consider so. No faith, not a jot, but to follow him thither with modesty enough and likelihood to lead it, as thus Alexander did. Alexander was buried. Alexander returneth to dust. The dust is the earth. Of earth we make loam. Whereto he was converted, might they not stop a beer barrel, Empiris, Caesar, dead and turned to clay? Might stop a hole to keep the wind away, or that earth which kept the world in awe, should patch a wall to expel the winter flaw, but soft, but soft aside. Ghoul may know what he and his minions are doing is wrong, but they do not think about death as we think about death. They do not think of returning to dust. They are, in a sense, undead creatures, monsters completely unlike mortals, where people can be resurrected or brought back as knights, or even l intelligent lizards can be made to walk the earth once more. And they recycle, they kill a person, well, when a person in the tomb expires, they are resurrected once more so that they can be used more for their engine. It's a broken, weird magic system that can be eternally propelled on itself. Death in real life is sudden and life-shattering. People that are once pieces of our lives now disappear forever, unable to return our calls which 
always seems wrong and unnatural that someone could just disappear from your life. And every human in history has felt the same way about death and how it shattered their experiences. Even the great conquerors and kings of the earth felt that, felt those great, noble, and tragic losses. But Ghoul is, in fact, twice removed from this reality, as one, in MMOs, things respawn all the time, even the good things that aren't undead, but also because they are also role-playing as undead. They are twice removed from the reality of death. Ghoul thinks it would be harder to explain to a bunch of NPCs that they were made by a bunch of squishy humans playing a game and role-playing stuff from their favorite horror movies, instead of, you know, just letting the farce continue. And continue it does. If you think about the morality of MMOs on a practical level, not just the good or bad things that happen inside. Any side, any kind of creature does the same thing. They get on, they do quests, they hold points, they defeat enemies that seem to respawn forever, they wait for them on certain parts of the map, they get in a big group in order to take down bosses. The flavors are different, whether it's to gather corpses to build an army, or to protect the village from some kind of bandit, or to take down someone else's general, they just color swap them. MMOs are all about loots and killing stuff, no matter what side you go on. The actions of the players and the stories are separated a little bit. You don't think about how an MMO hero affects the everyday person living their lives. But when this MMO crashes, as in Al's case, or Al's case, Ghoul's case, when Ghoul's castle crashes into a land, and I suspect also other similar people do too. Even though he has a facade of evil, I'm pretty sure the show is going to demonstrate that whatever light side is like the alliance in that MMO game is going to be just as destructive, if not probably more evil than Ghoul and his minions, and will probably be taken down eventually. They keep hitting at it. It might not happen. I don't know. This ironic behavior destroys people's lives. I expect when either side, either Alliance or Horde, start messing with the people of a real world, it's going to look a lot less like an MMO server and a lot more like how the demons treat humans in Berserk. Now I really want to see Guts take apart Nazrak. Man, I shouldn't have thought about that. Uh, now I'm just thinking about Guts taking everyone apart with his big old sword, being angsty. Uh. Oh, I'm lost. Where are we? I shouldn't have brought up Guts and Berserk. What's what's going on? Hey, isn't this Overlord? This No, this isn't Overlord. This is how not to summon a demon lord. What's up with light novel titles and negatives? This is a silly show, driven by one or two scenes of overt fan service. In every other episode, the main characters also role-playing as an evil thing in order to overcome social anxiety. But this guy uses words of evil and posturing to do nice things, like heal and protect. And in order to defend your attack, people barely even get wasted in this show. What? That doesn't count. Someone else did that. That doesn't count as a kill. You threw that one. Hint Saddle is like a hero harem thing. It's a little more lighthearted than Overlord, but it really takes the mantra of actions speak louder to words, more to heart. As the Demon Lords words are evil and conceited and selfish but his actions are to help others around him and the cute cute girls that he likes you know when his actions aren't trotting over consent there's last week's video for that uh let me summon a link to the other video Irony, irony, irony. I keep using this word. What does it mean? Irony is making impressions of one thing while the opposite is true, often used for jokes or comic things. Irony is the internet's favorite thing and it means something a little bit different on the internet because it means you pretty much do whatever you want and 
use that as a weird tacit defense for whatever terrible things you do not considering empathy or other people and hiding behind your privilege. Irony masks your true self. Irony is used as a performance for something that is not believed. Or, as ContraPoints points out, irony can be something to mask your belief until you're comfortable saying it, or until it's safe to come out and be blunt with it. Ghoul and Demon Lord believe themselves to be- Wait, is that- That might not be true. But most people like to assume that they're good, like by default. This is why people justify actions in video games when they're the main character, because, you know, they're not bad people, so the character they're controlling is not a bad person. See The Last of Us. As far as irony and performance, we see Overlord think one thing and do another. His surroundings, his environment that he has set up for himself, makes it so that it encourages a certain type of action and interpretation of his actions no matter what they are. This should sound familiar, as we act differently depending on the situation. If you're going to a familiar family setting, you're going to go hang out with your favorite uncle and eat the one dessert that you really like more than all the others. If we're going to Fight Club for the first time, we have to fight. If we're going to a sports game, then we might riot if everyone else riots. If we go to a library, we're gonna be quiet and sit somewhere in the corner, maybe do our own thing for like a little bit and then leave. Human behavior differs on our surroundings and our situation. Many, many times the situation can be used as an excuse for bad behavior like hazing or fighting or violence or setting things on fire or stealing or saying off-color jokes or voting republic. We also see with people that usually when you want to do something, you put yourself in a situation where that thing can happen. For example, there's this guy in, in high school that wanted to fight people. So he would put himself into arguments and then ask if people wanted to fight. I don't know if he actually fought anyone. Maybe it, just, maybe it was just me. I always told him no. Of course they don't want to fight. Shut up. <laughs> Let me disagree with you. No. Sometimes you cannot want to do something, but your situation and the peer pressures thereof make you do it. For example, I went to a roller derby, which is women on roller skates racing a snitch around for scores, which isn't the most... It, it's up there for punk sports you can watch, but to feel like a real sport, they still played the national anthem, and everyone stood up, and I did not want to stand. I wanted to sit or take a knee, but I ended up standing because I looked around at all these people, some of them bigger than me, everyone genuinely standing and waiting for the thing that is about to happen and just want to get this part over with. So I stood as well to get this part over with. It is extremely hard to overcome a situational peer pressure. You try sitting or kneeling for the national anthem. And if people ask you why you're doing it, I just wanted to see if I could, might not fly. You might want to just stick with the cause, like you're concerned about police violence against black people. That would be, that's the best shot. It would be dumb to think that what we are, what we have been socialized to do, does not carry to and back from the internet. Affections for certain line of thoughts, GTFO messages, memes, jokes, and prejudices for certain kinds of people carry over and affect our own lives. We are socialized by all of our surroundings, including the internet. Think Daru from Steinsgate, who can only speak in Leet. There are people that take the not-so-serious, disingenuous meme speak from online and take it everywhere. They might not take it to so to family gatherings, but when they're on friends or the perceived peers, they're every bit the shitlord that they were online. Being disingenuous, ironically listening to bad things, maybe you've been rickrolled in real life, or worse, someone has played a Catholic priest that doesn't believe in birth control, sitting in the middle of the woods, saying the n-word at you. Why are we watching this? Why would you do this to me? Why are you posting my real life? I have other friends that stick up for these people, saying they're not serious, they're just getting into it. They're a good guy once you get to know him. No. They say the person's just getting excited. They're just performing a persona. They just into this character right now and they really find it entertaining. That person sucks. That person sucks and this is and they are 
deep down. There is no deep down. The things you say and do are you. If you don't believe them, then don't say them or post them online. You are what you pretend to be. You are the effect that you leave on the world. Looking past the surface is someone that doesn't get it and doesn't understand empathy or other people. You are what you do, and because by default you feel like you're a good person, and every decision you've made is most likely something that you think you had to do and that you do not regret doing, that you would do again. Online, the lines are blurred between actions and words in that what you say as a joke has an actual effect of person that is honestly trying to harass someone. It doesn't matter what you assert it was or how much of a joke you think it is. You're a stranger online that just used a racial slur. You're a terrible person. There is no deep down. There is no just jokes. Online reality is reality. We need to take the actions on Reddit, on YouTube, on 4chan, on 8chan as serious and real, no matter how many avatars people hide behind. That is what these people are. They are their actions. Just like the ironic white supremacists that ironically want an ethno state, that talk about Kekistan, that talk about attack helicopters. Shit. People. Everyone. <laughs> So you just came here for the fun? For the fun. Yeah, yeah, so you're not a real white supremacist. Barely. It's kind of a fun idea. Which part? Uh, just being able to say, like, hey man, white power, you know? Yeah, what, what's the, where's the fun part come? Start chasing you and then he took the uniform off. So are you going to put it back on? Or put it, quite honest. Yeah, yeah. I love to be offensive, it's fun. It's a, so it's like a um, cosplay. I don't want to talk. So, but are you going to put your white supremacist uniform back? Hamlet is a Shakespearean play about a prince of Denmark who finds out that his father was murdered by his uncle who is now the king. And so he wants to kill the king. That is his assertion. But instead, Hamlet has indecision about it the entire play. Hamlet's fatal flaw is overthinking and being thorough. Hamlet is a man's struggle to commit to action. He does not take action to kill his uncle a few times because first he wants to make sure his uncle goes to hell and then he wants to be sure that his uncle did it and then he wants his uncle to confess. In order to do this instead of acting like a cunning person who has a plan who's up to something, Hamlet acts like a crazy person. Hamlet makes enemies. Hamlet rejects women. Hamlet's ironic facade of a crazy person covers up how he's really a crazy person inside who thinks that ghosts are real and that everything is against him and that he has to murder his uncle and does not consider things like the stability of the kingdom, how would it affect other people, how the people in his lives are being tortured by it. Hamlet mumbles crazy words and phrases. He acts inappropriately and hurls insults at people. He is literally trolling people. The consequences of Hamlet's ironic actions and his drive to have an ever more clear, concise plan only complicates everything. And at the end of the play, everyone is dead and the kingdom has fallen and invaded. It is actually pretty close to Overlord. Hal Ghul wants to delay several of his decisions and those delays actually make things more complicated and worse for the people. Several of his orders are kind of busy work until, you know, they're not and we're like invading kingdoms. There really is no happy ending coming for Overlord. He can either try to kill his humanity and as many people as possible to appease all the monsters that he has surrounded himself with. Or he can try to be sympathetic with the humans around him and spare them, but that sparing is seen as an evil act for an evil ends, which his surroundings will make sure make happen. Deferring to his lackeys, deferring to waiting for later, playing adventure to get recon turn to generally getting recon so they can generally attack and one day these evil acts might just come back to haunt him where someone will dethrone him 
or attack him or find out that he's really human after all and has been deceiving them all along. You either live with your murderous uncle on the throne and see if one day he kills you, or you can murder your uncle and unstabilize the kingdom, or you can make yourself a really big distraction until ultimately everyone dies and the kingdom falls. The internet's use of irony and satire to cover up for cruel monsters that have been here all along has caught up with us. We have learned that nerds are misogynists. They just had a nerdier kind of misogyny. The use of anonymous forums has led us to think that white and male are the default and anything otherwise is an intruder. People might point back to the 90s or 2000s or aughts or the 80s and say that this was a simpler time when we were at message boards and everything was a joke. But that was always a lie. That socialized people to be toxic and disingenuous and really let the worst of their behaviors come out in a place where they didn't have to think about the consequences of how it affected older people. Film critic Hulk says this in his article, Don't feed the trolls and other hideous lies of the internet. Terrible things from the internet have always had terrible consequences. People have just had privilege enough to avoid them or been disconnected enough to not think about them. Bad behavior on the internet is bad behavior no matter who does it, no matter what state they do it. And it's something that we don't like to hear, but it's something that we need to hear right now. But the thing we also need to hear is it is never too late to change your behavior. To become a better person with better surroundings, there might not always be a way to do that, but sometimes that way is just hidden between a lot of pain and a lot of not facing how real your actions are. There's a chance that your poverty or your job or your family puts you in a place where it's really hard to change your surroundings in order to be a better person, in order to get these toxic influences out of your life. And if you're in one of those situations, I feel for you. It is hard to leave. Sometimes a drastic change is needed because it's a lot easier to find new friends and switch your location than it is to change your friends and let that influence continue to warp you. And there are changes that we have to make because it's just a joke and the hand waving of actions because of satire or irony were always a lie. You are your actions and apologies do not fix things. Clinging to the thought that these people are good on the inside, that I know them, that they're like me, that they're good, is a certain kind of laziness that has brought us to this point where there are Nazis on the street. White nationalists have influence everywhere, even to the point where we're not sure if an okay sign is racist or not. The question isn't if it's racist, the question is why do racists have such an influence over our culture? Why are they so broad? The questions are who is being used by them and who is being useful to them and who is allowing them to exist in our public spaces. White nationalists won the marketplace of ideas once before and that ended in the Holocaust. They can't be allowed to win again. They can't be allowed to take part in the same discussions that we take part of. And they can't be shielded by ironic troll play. This laziness allowed the neo-Nazis, the white nationalists, the white supremacists, and the people that want a white ethno state, and the people that just want to get rid of the Mexicans and the Muslims, a seat that is one in the same. They are birds of a feather. People that think white and male should be the default for voices that are heard walk right alongside trolls and pepes. They walked right alongside them in Charlesville. A protest of a crappy statue that was voted to be taken down by the people that live there and where a counter protester was murdered by a car. And then white nationalists and idiots that are useful to white nationalists said that the person had a heart attack and said the other injuries didn't happen. They're liars and we allow them to have a voice. And then look at this guy. He was marching along with the Nazis. He's wearing their thing. It's hilarious. It's just a joke though. Why is everyone being so serious when it's just a joke and he's let Nazis be on the street next to them and he's bolstered their numbers? I know this is a lot of the trolls on the internet, 
But I also know that that guy really believes the things that he's marching for because he's marching for them. He really thinks it's funny. He really thinks they're good ideas. It's not just a joke when you're on the street. That joke is just an intention. It's just a word. Where you're marching, your harassment is action. Now, there's a few ways that I've outlined Overlord could end. But let me paint one for you that I feel is extra fitting. Ghoul has rooted his fortress and lackeys into every civilization. There isn't a court on the world that he doesn't have a seat on or doesn't full right control from the tomb of Nazareth. Humanity is now an engine of sacrifices for him. All of his lackeys prepare to feast on the mortals for a millennia. Ghoul's allies have been twisted and warped into monstrous beings by his influence, the evil alchemist and the goblin commander power couple, the warlock spy, the tainted swordsman. Ghoul feels something that he hasn't felt in years, a sensation that circles around his head. Is this dizziness? He retires to his chamber and lies on his bed. The world goes dark. And he dreams of nightmares, the monster he has become, his teeth sinking into the raw flesh of the earth. The smell of blood and iron fills his nostrils, and his teeth break down the raw meat tendons. His stomach is full and he no longer hungers, yet he has eaten more and more. He wakes, astonished at his dream and feels an odd sensation. His eyes have wrapping on them. He blinks for the first time in years. His hair falls into his view and he finds his face bob with the rhythm of his breathing. The air is stale and his mouth reeks of blood. He reaches for his familiar and sees the pale of his own skin. Where there was once only pointed bone fingers, he sits up in bed shocked and disgusted waves of realizations wash over his mind he touches his body in all the places where he saw people dismantled torn apart with swords and spears on spikes and chains feels it all in a second and in the next second there's a knock at the door he shrinks in his bed he is a frail lowly human in the middle of a world of devouring monsters of his own creation, and he has returned to the form that he has taught them to treat as little more than the dirt that they walk on. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take up arms against the sea of troubles, and by opposing end them, to die. To sleep no more, and by sleep to say, we end the heartache, and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Tis a consumption devoutly wished to die, to sleep, to sleep perchance to dream. Aye, there is the rub. For in that sleep of death what dreams may come, when we have shuffled off this mortal coil, must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long a life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrongs, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that panted the merit of the unworthy, when he himself might his quietest make with bare bookin, who far dells bear to grunt and to sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country for whose burn no traveler returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus, consciousness does make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sickled o'er the pale cast of thought and enterprises of the great pith and moment. With this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Soft you now, the fair woman, nymph in thy Osiris.
be all my sins remembered. Comment, like, subscribe.